Uh, good evening, sorry for the slight delay, but welcome to the University of Washington. Uh, my name is Matt Powers, and I'm an associate professor here in the Department of Communication. Uh, I'm also a member of the department's journalism faculty and an associate director of the Center for Communication and Civic Engagement. Um, and I mentioned these affiliations not to say anything interesting about myself, but I think to underscore just simply the range of ways in which all of us uh, might relate to tonight's theme, which is about the future or potential futures of Seattle journalism. Um, so I'll just speak for, for myself and say that as a teacher, one of the reasons that I'm very excited and very interested about this is that my colleagues and I are constantly caring about this issue because it bears directly on how we prepare our students for potential careers in journalism. What skills should we be teaching them? What types of training should they have? What types of ethical issues do they have to be aware of? Um, as a researcher, I care about this issue because it informs the very things that I go about studying. So what works, what doesn't, and for whom are things working? Um, and as an associate director, I'm committed to the idea that important problems benefit from engagement amongst multiple stakeholders. And it's that larger point that I just want to stress from the outset before we get going, which is that I think it's true that we all have a stake in the future of Seattle journalism. So I think it's true that if you're a journalist in Seattle, you clearly have a stake in the future of Seattle journalism. But I also think it's true that if you're an advocate who's hoping to have your voice heard, that you have a stake in it. Or if you're a community leader that wants to know what it is that different groups of people think about particularly salient social issues, that you have a stake in it. And that in that sense, I think it's fair to say that journalism is basic to civic life in Seattle, and therefore we all have an interest in caring about it. The idea for tonight's event is relatively straightforward. And that's simply to move beyond what you might think of as a sort of familiar narrative that gets told about journalism today. Um, this is a narrative that emphasizes a couple of key things. The first is that news organizations are struggling to secure sustainable business models. The second is that news audiences are turning away from traditional news and focus instead on partisan fare. Um, or sometimes simply shun news altogether, and that journalists' jobs are highly precarious. <clears throat> now, this is a familiar story, in part because it's true. Um, in Seattle, to simply give an example of something that I think is particularly stark and I think is indi indicative of some of the change over time, um, it's true that the number of paid full-time journalists has been cut in half over the past 15 years and that's even when you account for some of the new news organizations that have come into being. So it would be misleading to ignore this sort of major narrative. But at the same time, um, this is a narrative that misses a whole range of important developments, and that's really what we're trying to get at tonight, or hoping to discuss. And that's simply that many journalists are not simply just sitting idly by, um, but are instead engaged in various efforts to rethink what it means to be a journalist today. And so the event tonight is about exploring some of these efforts. Uh, the uh, idea is simply to talk about opportunities and challenges that our panelists are facing with these efforts, and hopefully to engage in a larger community conversation. To that end, I'm very excited to have four people who are doing, I think, very, very exciting work across a range of different news media in Seattle. And so I'll simply start by introducing them, um, beginning from my immediate right. We have Florangela Davila from Crosscut, followed by Jill Jackson of KUOW, followed by Annika Anand of Where By Us, and followed by Joy Resmovitz from the Seattle Times. Um, and before I sort of turn it over to them, I'll just mention a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, first, we have to thank both the Online News Association, the Department of Communication, and the Center for Communication and Civic Engagement for sponsoring this event and making it possible. Beyond that, for those interested, there are upcoming events, and one that I'll flag is, is one that's coming up on Monday, May 20th, in this same room at this same time, 6 p.m., and its theme is uh, Communicating Climate Change in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and it will be done by the co-associate um, director of the center, Adrian Russell, 
and it will bring together some of the region's leading climate change communicators. And so this will include journalists, but also activists, researchers, and so forth, to discuss both successes and failures in cultivating meaningful engagement on this important issue. Tonight's format will have three parts. Um, so we'll start simply with each of the speakers introducing themselves, and we'll simply start with Florangela and move down from there. And they've agreed to address three prompts. So I'll just let you know what the prompts are. And the first is what their current position is. The second is what's something that they're working on and that, are, that, that they are excited about. And the third thing is what's something they're working on and they're nervous about. So this is really just to get things going. They'll each speak for somewhere between three and five minutes. After that, we'll have a discussion amongst the panelists uh, where I'll ask a couple of questions and we'll go back and forth for about 30 minutes in that way. And then we'll turn it over to the audience for a question and answer. We've tried to build in ample time for question and answer so that we can try and get a range of perspectives on the issues confronting Seattle journalism moving forward. So without any further ado, thank you for coming and we'll start with Florangela. Hello and good evening and thank you. Uh, my name is Florangela Davila. My current position is I am the managing editor at crosscut.com. We are an online news site, part of Cascade Public Media, the editorial sibling of KCTS 9. Uh, we are fiercely independent, nonprofit, and community oriented. The thing I'm most excited about is we are expanding. Uh, we are hiring um, a new uh, visual journalism editor. We are hiring the, a, a position that is um, dear and near to my heart, um, having been a longtime journalist in Seattle. Uh, we're hiring a reporter to cover Central Washington. We are a Seattle-based outlet, but we realize that our public is hungry for news across the region. So we, we just posted it. It's uh, a primarily a written position, but it's gonna be true multimedia. We deliver news in words and in visuals and in moving images. Uh, I am really, really excited about that. Um, the fact that we are expanding also, to be honest, makes me a little nervous. Um, it means a growing newsroom. It means launching new projects. It means being mindful of storytelling and not being, um, not getting caught up in sort of the wows and the looks of things, um, but really remembering what our central tenets are as journalists um, and as a journalistic outlet. Uh, I think I get a little nervous about having a lot of projects and wanting to, to do them all well versus having a few projects and wanting to do those great. So how do you strike that balance in terms of capacity and in terms of desire and in terms of innovation? So that's, uh, that's, what, that's me. I'm Jill Jackson. I am the news director at KUOW, the um, NPR station, one of the NPR stations here in Seattle. Um, I am incredibly excited about all of the work we're doing on new platforms. Um, we have been working on new podcasts within the newsroom. We have a podcast on Amazon and how it's changing life as we know it. We have a podcast called Sound Cues, which is a way to reach beyond, ideally, our current audience, but also serve our current audience, taking questions of what we should be following, what news stories are you interested in, what do you want to know about this region? And we'll take, we'll go, sift through the questions, go through them, and then do a podcast and broadcast um, piece on the, on a, an interesting question. Um, we're also experimenting on smart speakers. So we're kind of trying all these different platforms, including while we still serve both broadcast and the web. So that brings me to what I'm super nervous about, which is that we can't just do the same story for each platform. They have to be different. You want to optimize. You want to tell the story best on that platform. So that means that you know, we used to have the whole debate over, should we be web first, broadcast first? Well, now it's like, is it podcast first? Is it web first? Is it broadcast first? Is this something that's gonna go on our newsroom podcast, which then would go out on the smart speaker? Do we have, which voices do we use to introduce those pieces? Is it one, is it, is it just random grab someone to read your intro and put it on there? 
it's a lot of moving parts with the pretty much same existing staff. Um, although the one very exciting thing we have going on at KOW is we have an actual podcasting department for sort of some bigger podcast projects that are outside of the newsroom. Um, but it is, it's a lot for us to deal with. It's very exciting. But it's also um, one thing that also excites me about it is that we get a lot of data from these other platforms that we don't get on broadcast. So I can't tell, all I can tell from Nielsen ratings is what happens over a 15 minute period. I can't tell if someone's listening and then tuning out, changing the channel, anything. I don't know what stories of ours might influence anything in terms of listenership on the radio, but we get all this really granular data on the other platforms of, on the web it's clicks, on the, on pod, on the smart speakers we can tell when someone drops out, and that is going to be really useful information for us going forward. Uh, hi, I'm Annika Anand. I'm the product director at Where By Us. Uh, so I helped co-found the Evergrey in uh, 2016, and uh, that's a daily email newsletter all about Seattle. And we also produce original storytelling and video storytelling, as well as events across the city. And our goal is really to help people feel more connected to where they live and feel like they can make a difference in the future of the city. Um, so the parent company of uh, the Evergrey is Where By Us. And um, after working to launch the Evergrey, I started working with Where By Us uh, to develop an editorial strategy across all of our cities. So the goal is to uh, take the model that we have here in Seattle and uh, try it in other cities across, across the country. Um, as the product director, I am now responsible for figuring out uh, what we make and how to make money and grow audience off of those products that we develop. So the thing that I am most excited about is developing a new product uh, that helps us get more ambitious about the kind of reporting and ongoing projects that we want to do around big urban challenges that we're facing um, in each of our cities. Um, it is exciting to take on something like that, um, but it's also very, very expensive, as we all know here. And so what we are trying to figure out is how to develop this product that can serve our users as well as potential advertisers and figuring out where the intersection is of those needs um, so that we can be sustainable long-term while still producing great reporting for our city. Um, so I'm excited by the possibility of that, but also nervous because it is very difficult to figure out where that intersection is um, and how to get it right every time so that we're being ethical in how we're working with advertisers um, and we're holding ourselves to a high standard for the reporting that we want to do. Hi, I'm Joy Resmovitz. Before I talk about myself, I want to thank our host for convening an all women panel. That's pretty rare and exciting, so kudos to him. Um, thank you for coming to listen to what I've talked about and help us figure out really the future of this thing that is really important to all of us. So I am the education editor at the Seattle Times. What that means is I oversee the newspaper's education coverage most of which is a pod called Education Lab, which is community-funded, solutions-oriented group. But what's pretty cool is that innovation is written into our charter. So here we are in this legacy media organization charged with doing things that are cutting edge. So how does that work? It um, fits nicely into the prompt. It results in lots of things that are both exciting and extremely nerve-wracking, given we have the possibility to fail. Um, what I'm excited about at the moment is we've kicked off a cycle of Reporting with the idea of putting our audience in the driver's seat. And, you know, this work builds on the work of my predecessors, two of whom are here, both on again, I think I see one wish off over there, um, who really laid the groundwork for us to be a little more radical and democratic about how we cover the news. What that means is convening little groups of our readers before we put their stories. I think previously, or in other newsrooms where I've worked, engagement or Social media has been an afterthought. It's the platform on which you distribute your stories. The idea for us is how do we let the people who the stories are about guide what we write? Um, so it's getting them together, asking them to vote on ideas. What do they want to know? Can we bring them along in our reporting process? And what's scary about that is that we're really relinquishing control, particularly as we dive into a coverage area that's 
extremely challenging. So that's what I'm nervous about. Um, we've chosen as our topic for launching the cycle of reporting and engagement all at the same time, something we're calling specialized education, which is another nerve-wracking thing. It's a new term. It doesn't really mean anything, but we're trying to give it meaning. Um, we decided that we want to write about untraditional students, including special education. Um, but we thought that the term untraditional students placed a stigma on those students. So instead, we wanted to um, turn the focus to the system that is serving them or not. So it's really scary to go into this more um, radical and democratic way of getting news when we're launching with this new topic that's complicated, where we're charged with finding solutions, but it's sort of hard to find. So I hope that you'll all help us with that. Great. Um, I wonder if, uh, as a first question, this is sort of with my journalism teacher hat on, one of the things that journalism students always want to know is how did these people get these jobs and what tips or strategies do they have for someone, you know, as they go out and try and make a career for themselves in journalism. So I wonder if we could just have each of you talk a little bit about your own profile and what would be some lessons learned or tips, tips or strategies that you have for someone who's at the University of Washington studying journalism, wants to have a career, I'll, I can start. <laughs> um, so I uh, graduated from the Jackson School here at University of Washington and um, immediately was unemployed except for um, I had, I, worked, I wasn't unemployed, but I worked at the People's Pub in Ballard serving German beer. And, <laughs> um, and I was thinking about maybe joining the Peace Corps. I started down that process and then I got an internship at KOW. And, um, completely fell in love with the news. I mean, completely. There was, uh, there was no doubt in my mind that this is what I wanted to do. And I would, I mean, it, we had a huge snowstorm. I walked like, I walked from the East Lake neighborhood here. I was like, I'm going. And on that day, I got to do all the things that I never got to do. Like I got to write, I got to go on air, I got to do all of these things. Like I made it to the office when a lot of people couldn't get in. And that was a huge opportunity for me. Um, I ended up <clears throat> moving out to Washington, D.C. I lived there 13 years, and I um, covered Congress as a reporter for public radio. I spent a year at NPR for all, at working for All Things Considered, and then I worked for CBS as a congressional producer and then at Face the Nation um, before moving back here to be the news director at KOW. So it was kind of full <laughs> circle. But um, I feel like the biggest thing I've learned both as both trying to trying to make it and, and all of that was that people, I mean, I see it in the people I now manage. I love people who are excited to be there and just bringing this like, this energy and passion and that this idea of like, yes and, although, or yes or. I mean, you know, I want people to bring their fresh ideas and perspectives to those meetings. I want people to be excited to be there. and. Uh, it's something, it's a certain magic that you get in the beginning that sometimes can be hard to sustain, but I think it's something you just want to try and like feed that, you want to, you want to pay attention to that, why you fell in love with it in the first place and sustain that for your whole career. Um, I would also just say that I felt when I, when I did move from covering Congress as a reporter for an outfit that, um, that co we served stations all over the country, I went to NPR, I was there for a year temping. And it just, I felt like I was hitting my head against the wall. I didn't feel like I was really going anywhere there. And when the CBS opportunity went, came up, I jumped. And I think that was really actually the best decision I ever made was being willing to like, I thought, I thought if I could just get my foot in the door at NPR that they would see how excited I was and I would, I would make it. And it just wasn't quite happening. The temp world there is really difficult. And so um, the CBS job came open and I have to tell you being in Congress, like I had an office on the house side of the Capitol covering everything from the financial collapse in 2008 to Supreme Court nominations to the rise of the Tea Party, all of these things to be there was such an exciting thing. And it was the best choice I ever made was being like, I don't think I'm really going to, recognizing that I didn't think I was going to make it very much further at NPR. So being willing to make a move. Uh, so I, um, did not study journalism as an undergraduate, uh, but I was interested in journalism, and at the time I was living in the Bay Area, and all the internships that were available were unpaid, which wouldn't work for somebody like me who was trying to live on their own and needed a job. 
um, and didn't have a trust fund to be able to afford a, an unpaid internship. So I decided to go to uh, graduate school. Um, so I went to J School at Columbia in New York, and I always love talking about that, happy to talk about to folks afterwards about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. For me, it was a very good thing because I knew it would get my foot in the door. Um, and my colleagues had some, uh, had some experience. Uh, I worked with people who had you know, one or two newspaper jobs. I had zero, and we each had and um, benefited from J School at the time. I um, got a wonderful piece of advice, which I continue to pass on. I was really interested in going into television into broadcasting, and the broadcast people would always tell me that oftentimes they had moved from print to broadcast. But I um, hadn't met a lot of people who were in broadcast that moved to print. So having been in the, on the broadcast track, I thought it would be more beneficial to pursue print because I would have more options. To this day, I think writing is a key, a, one of the key things for any platform. I ended up working as a print reporter, a small daily newspaper in the Bay Area covering schools. That is another piece of advice. If you can get a journalism job at a small daily paper, you will do everything. I was a schools reporter. I ended up covering a gas explosion. You end up covering sports. Um, you really are part of the community, and it is a great, great job to, ha to be in such a small newsroom. I ended up coming back to, coming to Seattle for the first time, worked here for 14 years at the Seattle Times, so worked as a print reporter. Um, then moved and took a risk in uh, 2008 to work uh, as a freelance public radio person, um, public radio reporter for KNKX. At the time, it was KPLU. So transitioned, and what, was a, what allowed me to transition well from print to radio was that I could write, and I could write conversationally. So that was a pretty easy transition. Um, I also spent a few years working at a nonprofit, so I actually left journalism, which I think also gave me some perspective, um, made me think about um, community engagement as part of the communications team, which is something I'm sure we'll all talk about because that is something that's really key for any successful journalism organization right now. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to leap to an online site, CrossCut. Um, where I now get to manage a team and work with all kinds of reporters, including print reporters or words reporters and um, video producers. Um, and again, the writing is important. I think a lot what Jill said is that um, you want curious people, you want people who are hungry. I have a diversity of experience in the newsroom, people who have been doing this a long, long time, and that fire is still there. They are still eager. No story is a boring story. No story. Every story has potential. And I have um, I work with colleagues who've never had any formal training, but have found their way into uh, being great, amazing reporters, and they're equally hungry. I think um, having that hunger, having that curiosity, having that commitment to your community, and wanting to break news, as long as you hold on to that, you will find your way. You will find a newsroom that is um, is excited to have you. I am an accidental journalist. I started college as a pre-med student, and I joined my class, uh, and a chemistry major, and to this day, organic chemistry is still my favorite class. I really don't know. Um, yeah. um, but I wound up joining this newspaper because I, wanted, I went to school in New York, and I wanted free Broadway tickets. Accidentally took out the news training box. Next thing I know, some guy who's a news trainer at my university but intern at the New York Daily News is waving Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's sneaker in my face. He found it on a stakeout. I'm like, oh, what is this world? So I wind up taking an assignment. I don't know anything. I break the tape recorder. I have to go back to the dean for another interview. It was embarrassing. I was a freshman. I had no idea what I was doing. But pretty soon, I became addicted to this form of work where you're just learning things all the time. I'm mostly curious. You know, I came to the determination that I would rather be talking to people than have my hands in bodies when they can't talk to me. Um, and, you know, just one thing led to another. I was in New York at HuffPost covering the National Education School, which gave me also some valuable DC experience. Um, I did a summer covering crime for the New York Daily News. Um, and it felt like I was on this path of trying to learn everything, but also, as Florendola, as Florendola mentioned, finding my special finding the thing, the topic that I could find endlessly interesting for a very long time. Um, and I think that helped me. Um, as far as advice, I guess I would say just to be aware that this is not just a profession. And when young people ask me, 
for advice, what I say is this isn't something you should do unless you can't see yourself feeling fulfilled doing anything else. If you do, then you have that fire and that magic that's going to sustain your career long term. But if not, maybe go somewhere where there are more perks, where you can get paid. I mean, we're not, <laughs> I'm, I'm being honest. I mean, you do this because you believe in it, not because you think it's going to benefit any ancillary part of your life. Um, so I, I think the, the main takeaway from my uh, career in journalism so far is that it's all invented. And if any newsroom tells you right now that they have it figured out, they are lying to you. Um, the, the biggest thing I would say for any young journalist is to go into a newsroom and figure out what their challenges and problems are and figure out a way to solve it or at least a, an idea to pitch to them to how to solve it and you will find yourself a job. Um, I, I do think there are still lots of great, you know, more traditional reporting roles in these rooms, but there are increasingly more and more roles at the intersection of technology and journalism and product and all of these community engagement and all of these different functions that we're expecting from our newsrooms that we've never expected before. Um, so I, I graduated uh, from undergrad in journalism, did some internships, um, and went to grad school at the City University of New York uh, Graduate School of Journalism, um, which was dirt, dirt cheap, the best decision I made, because um, it was in-state, uh, and, and they provided lots of scholarships, they paid for your internship over the summer, which was amazing. Um, so I'm always happy to talk more about that program if you're interested. Um, and then I got my first full-time job at a nonprofit education news site called Chalkbeat, um, which Joy is also familiar with. Um, and uh, I started off as a reporter reporting on K-12 public schools in New York City. And pretty soon after that, I was asking a lot of questions about, like, is anyone seeing my story? Who am I writing this for? Um, what is this all for? And so uh, as I had more conversations with my boss, she was like, yeah, like, I think what you're describing is this conversation that many journalists are having around community engagement. So you should be our director of engagement. And I was like, okay, I don't know what that is. Um, but I set up a bunch of uh, coffee meetings with random people I found on Twitter and on the internet and asked them you know, if they had anything remotely related to social media or community um, in their job title. I asked them out for coffee and, and just said, what do you do? And then I learned from all of that um, and brought that into my experience. And so that's the thing that I think I've done over and over again in my career is, is focus a little bit less on what the job title is um, and figured out what are the problems to solve in this newsroom and how can I help contribute to that. And that would be you know, my, my main piece of advice for any aspiring journalists or anyone who wants to work in a journalism newsroom. Okay, thank you. So one of the tensions I think that each of you have touched on in some way is the sort of tension between doing the bread and butter traditional things that journalists are expected to do, so the public affairs reporting, the investigative reporting, while also innovating in all of these different platforms and formats. So I wonder if you could each talk a little bit about how you try to sort of square that circle or to deal with that tension and ways in which you feel like you've been able to do that well and other ways in which you sort of feel like, yeah, there are certain things that we can't do as much as we, as we might like. Um. The way that we handle that, the way that I handle that as a manager is by empowering the youngest person on my team to help coach the bread and the so-called bread and butter reporters into a more three-dimensional understanding of their jobs to sort of answer the questions that are raised by just looking for the problems, looking for the things that we're not doing. Um, but yeah, this is hard. I mean, I realize, for example, that a blind spot for us is we're writing about education, but we're not really reaching teens. So all of the newspaper media training that we've gotten isn't going to help us get there. So we're doing some soul searching and asking for some outside help on that question. And that feels like not a failure, but a, a shortcoming at the moment and something that we are trying to get better at. I don't know, because um, we have, for example, I mentioned the Amazon podcast that we've been doing. And the two people involved in that reporting are our transportation and housing reporters. And we budgeted that they would be spending 40% of their time 
on the podcast when they were working on season two. And that was just a com- completely, that it was a, you know, 40%. And it was 100%. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, we, there was overtime. There was, it was over 100%. So it was, um, it's really tricky when you're like, okay, but they're telling these amazing stories and getting these incredible sources for, of people who used to work at Amazon. Or I don't know if you saw the news lately about like the people who listen to conversations on their smart speakers that came out of the pod. Like people at Amazon are listening to your conversations if they end awkwardly with Alexa. Like that came originally, it was originally reported in our podcast. But that's like, someone needs to be telling the Amazon story, right? But at the same time, housing and transportation are obviously incredibly important here. <laughs> So one thing that um, we've talked about in terms of planning for season three is thinking of backfill, thinking of like having a better network of freelancers, a better network of people who we can put on a temporary assignment. Um, that is something that, that I'm really going to be working hard to do of like, and is an opportunity for up and coming journalists too, like people who are like, I have a story on transportation. I have a story, like, come with the pitch, come with the pitch. Um, we, uh, there are all kinds of, um, of, openings, I think, in our future where we're going to be needing some like short-term reporting help because we're going to be assigning some of our current reporters to some of these podcasts. Um, so, but it, it's really, it's tricky. Yeah, I guess what I would say is um, as a very, very, very small team, uh, it's, it's uh, and coming from larger newsrooms, I was, I was previously at the Seattle Times working for Education Lab, um, you realize pretty quickly you're never going to have all the capacity that you want ever mm-hmm. in journalism. I bet people at the New York Times feel the same way about not being able to cover all the great stories as we do as a team of like three people in Seattle. Um, and that just means vicious prioritization. It just means really thinking about who you're trying to reach and um, what they want and then what you can give them <laughs> in the immediate future, um, midterm and long term. And having to, um, it's a really bad journalism phrase, but drown your puppies, because that, that is part of the process in figuring out um, what, you can, what you can manage. And, and I do think part of that work has to be the bread and butter reporting, but then part of that work has to be the distribution and community engagement piece. Otherwise, it just doesn't matter as much anymore, because the internet is such a loud and, and crowded place, and you have to build in the time to reach the people. Um, otherwise, you know, you make a thing and no one sees it, why does it matter? I think I um, I work with reporters who keep their head down. Right, you're focused on your story. You just want to break. You're competitive. You're 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 hungry. And the the nice thing about the merger. So we were an, um, an independent online site, and we merged with KCDS nine, and our newsroom grew. And what that provided was the ability to have words people with video producers. And it allows sort of like literally thinking about your story from a different perspective. It sounds sort of kind of like a no-brainer. Of course you're gonna think of your story in that way through images versus words. But the cross-pollination of having teams, we have um, an opinions team, a science and environment team, an arts and culture team, and a news politics team. And having writers and video producers on those same teams allows cross-pollination, allows for creative uh, ways of thinking about what makes a good story and the different elements, and I think that is really beneficial. That kind of gets you away from just kind of the bread and butter. And the the other thing that um, is always kind of surprising to me, especially now when people are so comfortable with social media and are really aware that journalism, there's a brand element you have to put yourself out there, is that sometimes there is a little hesitancy to really put yourself out there. Whether um, whether it's explaining why a reporter reported the story the way they did, or sourced the story the way they did, or, or came up with the idea. And we are um, having more of that discussion, allowing the process to be shared a little bit more with the public. So in our newsletters, you may see um, our, our city hall reporter, David Croman, explaining how he got this investigative piece, what it took. And I think um, there might have been a little bit of nervousness initially, right? You just think your byline and your story speaks for itself, but then you realize that people really want to know how the sausage is made. Um, and so I think uh, there's that element of 
being able to share a, where stories come from, and I think that helps with accountability. It builds relationships with the public. It gets people excited and jazzed about the product as much as that energy. That energy is reflected in the newsroom as well. So a couple of minutes ago, Annika, you'd said, you know, at one point you were asking, like, who am I writing this for? And I wonder if we could just actually have each of you tell us who you think of uh, when you're, as your news audiences. Like, who are you envisioning that you're doing the work that you're doing for? Um, I can start, I guess, since I brought it up. So um, when we were first in the development uh, research phase for the Evergrey, we did um, dozens of, of one-on-one -on -one interviews with Seattleites to start to figure out um, who this ideal reader is. Um, and we uh, took all of that research and did some human-centered design thinking processes to um, start mapping that out and, and synthesizing all of that information. Um, so I could talk a lot about this, but simply put, um, you know, the, the folks that we're trying to reach are people who are in, uh, a, I wouldn't put a, a, an exact age demographic on it because we actually see a lot of people 65 plus engaging with our um, newsletter as well, but certainly um, young urbanites who uh, want to get out into the city and um, experience the city for what it has to offer. So that might be people who want to go to uh, the food festival that weekend or people who want to go to the latest panel on transportation in Seattle. Um, but it's just people who want to be engaged in the city in some sort of way um, and who uh, want to have a, a voice in, in the future of what's uh, happening. In Seattle. Um, we definitely, you know, in, in these early years, we're definitely focusing a lot more on the fun, delightful aspects of living in Seattle because we think it's an immediate way for us to um, distinguish our product and really get, you know, that, that broader kind of like top of funnel folk number of people um, who just want to, our, our tagline for the company is live like you live here. So who really just want to live like they live here in Seattle and feel connected to what's going on and feel like they're in the know. Um, and it's those folks who feel like they are going to have FOMO at any given time. So it's a very millennial phrase, but it's fear of missing out, um, who, you know, want to be everywhere experiencing what the city has to offer. So that's really for us, it depends on the product. So we have, um, <clears throat> for example, our sound cues team, the team that answers questions from our audience and community. Um, there, it's not a forward-facing persona necessarily, but we designed it that that it's something. It's for newcomers. There are so many newcomers here in Seattle, but that we also wanted it to be something. Every episode has to have something where a local would be like. Wait, what? I didn't. I did not know that about mm -hmm. Seattle, or I did not know that about the drawbridges. I didn't know that about that that topic. So there's always that wait, what moment, both in the in that one, and then in, with um, with uh, the Amazon podcast Primed, we wanted someone who the idea in our mind is it's someone who maybe owns an Alexa but feels a little creeped out by it and doesn't quite, like they think of they're a real Amazon consumer and yet they think about the trade-offs that they have to exchange for what they give up for the convenience that Amazon brings in their life. So really we ran at like the trade-offs that come with this extra convenience that Amazon brings to our lives, but it's, um, but yeah, someone who is just a little conflicted about it. And then for broadcast, um, Obviously, we want to reach beyond our current audience, which is pretty middle-aged, middle older, whiter. Um, and that um, there, I mean, I can say we are working with our community engagement team to try and, and get more feedback, like direct feedback on our broadcast work. Mm -hmm. So setting up meetings with the reporters going out into the community, into different communities and getting feedback, get it, and like hearing people respond to we have this thing called Curiosity Club that our community engagement team does where they will sit down to dinner with people who've applied to the program and they just sit and talk about a piece with the reporter and ask them like, why, you, why did you approach it this way? Or this made me think about this, why didn't you explore that? And so kind of being open to getting that feedback. But um, generally in terms of broadcast, we, are, we create and serve a, a more informed public. So we're trying to meet people where they are, we're not dumbing it down. Um, We 
do quite a bit of surveying, so there is a document showing percentages, and I do not have it memorized. But I, I like to think of audience or uh, any topic issue as a series of concentric circles. You know, you have the people in the middle who, for us, are the policymakers, the legislators who have a deep and intense interest in education coverage, who we need to keep them interested, and we we have a good sense that they're there based on the impact that they're having. One level out um, is. Hello. Yeah. Is this better? Oh, hi, nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> thanks. Well, so this, uh, I'll start this one again. Um, audience concentric circles, starting in the middle, policymakers that we think we're reaching. One layer out are education professionals. There are a lot of teachers in this state whose jobs are tied to public policy. We think we're getting to some of them. The next layer out, parents who have a direct <laughs> interest in the school system and their children, who, as I mentioned, are an area that we need to grow on. And then one layer out, um, taxpayers who should care but probably don't. So sort of like the way Jill was describing, what the, the people that I want are, the, the thing that I think our stories need to do is we need to keep the interested and influential people still interested and have something new to offer. But I've been pushing us to be a little more conversational because I write about education because I think it's the most, or edit education because I think it's the most important domestic policy issue, and I think more people should care about it. And I think it should be as important to a truck driver as it is to a teacher. So I'm always looking for new points of entry. How do we get new people in? And also new communities that have felt underserved by the Seattle Times. How do we include them, get them into the conversation, keep growing while maintaining the center? We, uh, we are very mindful that Seattle is a very smart and informed audience. And we operate thinking that people already know what the, what the news is, what's happened. They're listening to public radio in the morning. They're subscribing to the Evergrade. They are getting their Seattle Times, whether it's digitally or on their front porch every day. Um, so we want to provide day two stories. Um, analysis, thoughtful storytelling, angles that haven't been explored, or, and or even stories that you're not going to find anywhere else. We know this is a competitive ecosystem, so why should we spend um, energy writing the same story that KOW is going to have or any of the television stations are going to do? What can we provide differently? So we approach storytelling in that way. But we're also, um, what, what's interesting too is just given the changing region, we're very mindful of the newcomers. And I think one of our most successful um, products that we've had lately or storytelling products is something called Mossbax Northwest, which is um, anchored by Skip Berger, uh, Knut Berger, who has been a longtime journalist in town. And I think what's really telling and interesting is that it connects to both longtime Seattleites, so a little bit like the sound cues storytelling, which is, you know, you may, you may have been a longtime Seattle person who's been living in the region, but here's a history lesson. Did you know that the Metropolitans, for example, was our first um, professional sports team and won the Stanley Cup way back when? But I think that history, given that it's that Seattle has attracted such a new wave of newcomers, people are hungry. People see the cranes. People know there's energy here. But people may not be aware of the legacy and what the what the neighborhoods and what the city has to offer. We also know that people are reading us who are not in Seattle. We have a very sizable percentage of um, of our subscribers who are outside of the region. So again, it kind of lends itself to thoughtful analysis, stories telling that you may not be getting in other places. I think that's what we're thinking, and that's what drives our stories. Great. So I'll ask one more question, and then we'll open it up. And I wonder if imagine a world of unlimited resources, so a very impractical world. Um, but I wonder what's a gap that you see moving forward in the Seattle news world that you think really needs to be addressed? I would say daily news that is delivered in, a, in languages other than English. Um, I uh, grew up in a bilingual household, 
have always been um, the person who picks up the little uh, newspapers in all the different, I'll pick up everything, right? And I'm always fascinated of that these um, entities exist and still thrive. Given the changing demographics, um, I think we are out of touch. I think mainstream newspapers and media organizations are mindful of having more reporters, more editors who have second, third language skills. Um, at CrossCut, I want to say we're really proud that we have experimented twice. It's small, but it's it's. I'm really proud of it that we've translated two different stories in Spanish. Um, they were both news stories, and we're thinking about translating stories that are not just news stories, that are not just about the Latino community in Spanish, because we feel that that is an underserved community. Um, so I would love to see more media delivered um, in other languages. I'd agree. <clears throat> um, we just, I'm very excited we just hired a new immigration reporter, Esme Jimenez, who is also planning to do her, her web pieces, both in Spanish and English, which is very exciting. Um, you know, I think in, for in the DC world, there were so many competing newsletters. Like, there are, I mean, like, and really good ones that can be from, like, on any topic that you could imagine, you could find a newsletter about it. And I just, sometimes in terms of when I start my day, uh, like, in D.C., when I would get read in, I would just be going to all these newsletters. Like, they would have done a lot of work for me. Whereas here, it's like, it's not, like, necessarily that, that things are going to come out really early in the morning or that, that all this, like, I'm, like, having to go kind of to all the places myself. I mean, sometimes the morning morning briefs will come out after our news meeting is already done. So I think there's a real gap in the newsletter culture in Seattle. Me too. Um, this is a hard question. I First of all, I agree with what Florangelo said about languages. We're also trying to translate more. And I was lucky to come from a newsroom in LA that had a sister paper that was Spanish primarily. Um, in terms of a gap, I guess I will answer this question in two ways. I mean, I am trained to think from my end, from the employees, and I don't know, I feel like I've seen a lot of newsrooms that are good in some ways, but not others. And, and I'm always thinking about how do I marry, you know, the nimbleness that I saw at the Huffington Post, but however was run by people who might not at that point have understood journalism deeply with the heart of a place like the Seattle Times or the LA Times that has the long values of journalism that we care about, but also expanding that to including other cultures. That's all a lot of word vomit mumbo jumbo, but it's sort of like the way my brain works is how do I, how do we piece together things that have worked in other places and bring it to the here and now? In terms of how that translates for readers, something that takes up a lot of my Brand space is accessibility, not just in terms of you come to our website, can you understand it, but but really bringing the news to you um, in terms of pieces like theater or, or having to do with culture or movies or zeitgeist, but using things that people want to experience that doesn't feel like work to them, that doesn't feel like, I don't know, I think I hear a lot from my lay people friends, my civilian friends, that the news right now feels like a chore. So what can we do to keep up the rigor while making sure that's not the case anymore, while translating it into perhaps a different sort of experimental format that involves the arts that people want to consume that doesn't feel quite as grating as this 24 seven churn we've created does? I'd just say plus one to all of those things. Um, there's obviously a lot more, again, that journalism and journalists could do for any community that they're serving. Um, I think Seattle is a city of neighborhoods, and um, it's it's it was surprising and a pleasant surprise to me when I moved here to see so many uh, neighborhood blogs and, and how awesome that network was. And I've seen more and more of those close down over the last few years. Um, and it would be awesome if there was a way to support create some sort of network for those sites that, to support one another. Um, but plus what on, on um, you know, uh, news being published in more languages, um, plus what on the newsletter stuff. And I think just in general, you know, if all of the newsrooms in the area could be thinking about more creative ways of um, interacting with news, news consumers in person, um, I think that would 
do really well in Seattle because you do have a very smart, engaged audience here um, who want to get out into the city and, and interact with the city and other people. Thanks. <clears throat> so what we'll do now is we will open it up to questions. Um, I believe we have a microphone that Anu is going to, um, OK, so it's up here. Um, so I think what we'll do is if you can just raise your hand, if you'd like to be able to ask a question, just raise your hand. Um, and we just ask that they are more like questions than statements um, so that the, we can have sort of interaction um, you can either direct it to a particular person on the panel or to the entire panel. And one last thing, if you can just identify yourself so that everybody knows who you are. Hello, I'm BJ Bullard. I'm a um, graduate of this university. Uh, I teach at Antioch University and I make documentaries. But I was curious about microjournalism and about the West Seattle blog. I happen to live in West Seattle. It's a really go-to source for many of us who are able to get um, news now, you know, if there's a traffic jam or if there's a, a wreck or something, <laughs> you know, it's, it's immediately right there. And I was wondering about the media ecos ecosystem in terms of your, um, how much do you draw on blogs like this? And do you see a role for not just microjournalism as in these blogs, um, but also a role for non-professional journalists to contribute uh, reporting aside from just uh, pitching new ideas. I'm thinking about citizen journalists. I know that's a lot. Um, I would say we, we definitely, so in the Evergrey, we have a section of our newsletter called um, What Seattleites Are Talking About, and so we pull from those neighborhood blogs um, whenever we see something that we think um, the rest of the city would also be interested in, so not necessarily the traffic jam story, because that affects you know, a very small percentage of people in that community, but um, something happening in that community that other folks would be interested in. So I, I would say we absolutely do draw from them. Um, and I'm a huge fan of citizen journalism. I think that there are ways to do it uh, really responsibly and, and to be thoughtful about it, and um, it, it does just take some time. Um, it's an upfront investment of having conversations with folks and training them a little bit about, you know, what the mission of your organization is and the best way for them to submit things to you. And then there's a vetting process that it has to go through. Um, so I, I'm a huge fan of it because I just think, again, no newsroom is ever going to be exactly representative of the community that it serves. And so it should be drawing from that community to make sure that all the voices are being included. Um, it is just a time investment. I would um, just add that, I mean, one thing I think is pretty interesting, um, WBEZ in Chicago has started um, kind of little bureaus in different neighborhoods. It could be a bureau of one or two, um, really trying to spread their reach to different neighborhoods. Um, so kind of, it's not necessarily, it's not citizen journalism, but trying to be more places by having tiny little bureaus throughout the city. And that's something that I think would be really cool to experiment with at some, t at some point. One thing that we've uh, really um, relied on and I think has uh, distinguished us in some respect is um, our opinions page, where we really do rely on um, community voices, where people are really allowed to um, express themselves. It's, it's certainly curated. There certainly is that um, investment. You do have to work with um, writers who may not um, have ever been published before. And I think that balances out and rounds out um, the, along with our columnists and our regular group. So there is that element. I think um, I am a big fan of microblogs. I know um, we are very mindful of um, the, the Renton Reporter. I believe that's an online site. I, maybe there is a printed publication, but I know that is um, of attention given some of the news in terms of the immigration news uh, that's happened in the last year. Our immigration reporter, Lily Fowler, pays attention to that site. And I think, you know, um, you're a journalist because you care deeply about the city and the place where you live in. And so I would argue that every journalist in our newsroom is very mindful of what's being um, produced in that sense. I would also applaud um, some of the new um, radio stations, the um, new kind of micro radio stations that have started up in different neighborhoods. Again, as one more outlet for people who want access, who want storytelling, who really want to talk about what is happening in, you know, in their area. Um, that I think that is a really nice development that is 
seems to have really taken off in the last few years. Jonah Fruchter, I'm the Director of Innovation and Business Development for Cascade Public Media. Um, my question is actually for Jill about podcasts. I'm a huge fan of The Wild and of the uh, Amazon podcast that you guys produce. But I did kind of notice a trend with your newer podcast that they seem to be focused on a broader audience than just locally. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the strategy behind that and, and some of the decision making that went that you guys went through um, when thinking about your next podcast. Sure. So we do two kinds of podcasts at KOW. We have our, we call it our audio shop and um, Brendan Sweeney is our director of new content and innovation. So he sort of runs that department. Um, and there are podcasts like um, Sound Cues, Primed, which is the Amazon podcast, another that we're talking with that we're piloting right now, that we would do no matter what, because they are newsroom priorities, they're important to Seattle. Like, we're not gonna be sitting there saying, you know, we're not gonna look at the metrics and be like, well, it didn't hit that metric, so we're not going, we're just not gonna do that anymore. We wouldn't do that with those. Um, that being said, we still have goals and all of that with uh, us that are related to the podcast, but they're newsroom priorities. And they're partner we do those in partnership, the newsroom and the audio shop. But then you, we also have podcasts like The Wild or Battle Tactics for Your Sexist Workplace um, that are truly born out of audio shop. And those have a, a lot more ambition. There's a lot more money and ambition behind them and rigorous goals that have to be met for them to continue. So it's um, because the idea is that those the audience there is, I mean, for The Wild, the audience is global. We had listeners in Australia. We have listeners in Germany. We have, you know, so it's very, um, it's exciting. For Primed, we actually found it was not necessarily, I mean, we have always thought there was a national audience for Primed, um, and we found that actually the majority of our audience in season two was outside of Washington State. So um, that is not, that's sort of unique to, to that one, even though it's a newsroom collaboration. Um, but both Battle Tactics, The Wild, they have different, their audiences. I mean, Battle Tactics, it's national. The Wild, it's global. Um, it's just a different model. I'm Jack Smith, citizen, interested. <laughs> uh, this may not be something you want to deal with, but the media is protected by the Sec First Amendment. And in light of the limited ownership of the media, I ask the question, does it still, is it still valid? No, free speech. No, actually, in the room. Right. Is that a question that people want to chew on for a minute, or then we feel It's a big one. It's a complicated question. I mean, in short, I believe it absolutely is still valid. I, I do. I think it's valid. It's critical. I think you need protection of the Constitution to hold powerful, the powerful accountable. And that's why we have in our newsrooms or in our organizations firewalls between the news content side and the money, the money side. So, and we have a policy. It's on our, it's on our website of what's okay, what's well, not, but we are very, um, we're very careful to not cross the line to keep our journalism independent. And we have journalists still dying out there in the world trying to cover this stuff. I think it's just, in, you know, people putting, put themselves at risk when they cover a lot of these stories. We'll run towards something that everyone else is running away from. And I think a reason you're seeing so much media consolidation Movements are trying to figure out how to how to make money, <laughs> what the business model is, how to be profitable. Um, so at the core of all of the challenges is, is the money question at the end of the day, and, and that's what I think you know, should be the entire industry's priority to figure out. Right now. Well, and I think you've also seen, uh, you know, just on a, on a 
basic human level, people are really hungry and curious to know who their neighbors are, who is representing them, who is living on their block. You know, I think the, the, one of the disadvantages of social media, or maybe it's an advantage, is you feel like, are you really getting to know, is there an authenticity? Um, are you knowing your neighbors? You have community forums, but are you able to really engage in conversation across difference? And I think uh, the media's role is, is to encourage those conversations, is to examine issues from all different places. Um, is, uh, it is one thing, you know, one of the, the ventures that we launched last year was something called a Crosscut Festival which was this big um, event, first time that we had tried it, to bring in, literally, to have conversations on stage and in person. Um, and we're doing it again this year, and in an even bigger way. It's actually next weekend, May 3rd and 4th, at Seattle University. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's compelling to see how hungry people are. I mean, I think this is a reflection, too, on a Tuesday evening when the weather is amazing and everybody wants to be out probably near the water or having barbecue, that you're in a room with the blinds drawn, having a conversation, curious about the local media that is in your neighborhood, and you want to connect. Um, so I think it, you know, it, it just reinforces and amplifies the need for local media. OK. <laughs> Other questions? Um, this is an interesting time for new institutions um, starting up in the US. Oh. Uh, Jeff McGee um, at Stanford University, working remotely in Seattle. Um, uh, just in the last couple of days, or the last 24 hours, we've had this sort of crisis at the, the markup, the new sort of tech and algorithm transparency investigative site that lost its editor-in-chief um, over a dis dispute about, well, apparently, you know, advocacy versus, you know, more traditional investigative journalism. And then the correspondent, which has been successful in the Netherlands, developing a network of informed uh, members who then comment on story ideas and are, are, I think, involved at the very beginning of the process. And then there was a big rollout to bring it to the US, and they raised a bunch of money, but then they weren't actually going to have an office here. So that's sort of a distraction, but something embedded in, in their methodology is you know, really community-oriented, really close to that. What do, you, what do you make? Are there things to learn, some good things to take out of these? these new ideas that people are bringing to the table? Um, I definitely think, so Le Diplomat is the, is the paper in, or the Netherlands outfit that you talked about, right? Or the correspondent, that's what it is, yes. So we um, actually, Jay Rosen came and spoke to some of us at KOW, uh, the media critic, and, and he told us all about that model. And I was really inspired by it. I think it's something um, where we're, we're all kind of doing a piece of that with our community engagement, but um, I think the key, given, given the lack of trust in media and that we've lost our sort of authority as, in the media that um, was really pretty, it was, we were so relied on for so long and trusted, and that is just not the case anymore. So I think trying to find those ways to bring community in and like, I said a lot of us are doing that with Harkin and other tools that help get you the questions and all of that, but um, the correspondent is taking it to a whole new level. I mean, they even have people, like the, they'll be involved in the editing, subscribers will be involved in the editing of pieces. Um, I don't know if I'm ready to go that far, <laughs> but I think kind of they're pushing this new thing and I think that, that it's exciting and um, it's, something to look at for ways we can get beyond just taking questions and letting people vote on what they what we want to do, which a lot of us are doing. Yeah, I guess what I would say specifically about the examples you cited um, is there are a, a lot of national uh, news startups that are raising a ton of money before they really um, know what their product is. I mean, that was, was kind of interesting to me about the markup, I think they raised like $23 million and they've been in development for like a year or something um, before even like launching the thing. And that's incredible to me at that. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, it's, it's great that a news organization can attract that kind of VC funding, but um, I would say that the thing that, you know, what has been so beneficial for us is just starting with the MVP, like the, the minimum viable product, the simplest thing possible, testing whether there's actually an audience for it, iterating really quickly in the beginning, and then growing it from there. Um, and maybe it's different for national news sites because they're in a, a different 
transition in terms of the talent they have to attract, but we benefited a lot from, from that uh, sort of simpler model. Sorry. Um, and to piggyback off of what Anika was saying, we're always trying new things and things that feel unorthodox to some who work for a daily newspaper. But to Anika's point, I think that sort of really big, I think it feels like a bubble of growth for new outlets that are able to raise that much money. I think that's ultimately why we saw this year a real bloodletting in New York at BuzzFeed and HuffPost where a lot of people that I know were laid off because people, these investors had an idea that they were going to make a lot of money off the news and so some outlets that I work for created new kinds of jobs that are not relevant anymore. So I really agree with what Monica was saying in terms of testing things and being a little more systematic in how we innovate. You know, yes and, but also yes and, but. Uh, Kathy Gill, once upon a time, a UW faculty. The elephant in the room that no one has actually talked about is algorithms, bubbles, and how that leads to not only distrust, but the collapse of institutions like democracy. How can we at the local level, not the national level, at the local level address those issues? That's a really good question. I think it's the elephant in every one of our newsrooms. I think it is a little, not that this is easy, but it's a little less daunting to attack at the local level because there are people who want to engage. So, you know, what I think about often is how do we build empathy with our coverage, not only in the stories that we write and, and being a little bit more deliberate about how we pick what we write and the type of people we write about and communities, but also the in-person events, forcing people to actually meet and talk with each other changing our comment system, which we did at the Seattle Times last week in a way that's supposed to be more conversational and be less toxic. So we're always driving toward constructive conversations with our coverage, which is part of why we focus on solutions journalism. And we're hoping that all of those ingredients can make people feel like they have things to say that are useful and less destructive and inherently distressful. I guess I would just say we, we don't want to become overly dependent on one platform, right? So um, Facebook uh, gave lots of media organizations a huge bump into what they did. And so we're really mindful of that. And we uh, one reason we started with the newsletter is because we can fully own and operate that platform um, and minus the occasional spam filter, end up in people's inboxes every day. And we have that direct relationship and direct connection to them. So I think that's hugely valuable. Um, and we have to keep figuring out, you know, where people are and, and make sure that we're creating things to keep them there. I would agree. I mean, I would say that we all took, I'm sure, I mean, I know KOW, we took a big hit on the web when Facebook changed its, um, its algorithm. So, and we are seeing a bounce back now, but it was really significant. Um, so I don't think that, that, I will be honest, we haven't figured out the answer. I mean, part of it is being on more than one platform. It's continuing. I mean, I think for us, sometimes the North Star is always like, okay, we just want to do good stories and make them something that people are going to want to seek out because that's our reputation. We want stories that are just like that people are going to be hungry for. And that is pretty powerful. And I think, you know, we look at... Um, we look at top posts each month, each week, actually, and we then get it all into a, a report each year where we're like, okay, these were the top performers, and I can tell you there's almost nothing that, you can't look at it and be like, ah, well, immigration stories, we should do more immigration. They're all so different, the top stories, and sometimes it's just one goes viral and you don't really know why. It could be timing, it could be, who knows? Like, you don't know why. There's so much we don't know. So I um, think, what the one trend I see is it's usually something where it's just a, it was a really well done story. 
but that's all I've got right now. But we're going to continue to try and figure it out. I think I'm going to boil it down into a really small example that, you know, we have a Slack channel in our newsroom. It's called Winning. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite channels because it's all good, positive news of, of how our stories are making an impact. And I think every time um, when we get an example of a story that's published and you hear that people have contributed $5, $10 because of that story, whether it's an investigative piece or something like um, what has happened to the gargoyles that used to be um, on a building at Seattle Center and now they've been taken to the dump. We, and we see that connection. Oh, I can't, there you are. I can't, so there you are. Um, it, it really is encouraging to me. I think people will pay for quality stories, stories that make a difference, but I think what would really help is when people understand all the work, why journalism, co the cost that it takes to produce good stories. And I think um, that is informed by greater media literacy, that is informed by um, more community engagement, more ways to really um, look at all the thoughtfulness that is going in, you know, how vetted the stories are, all the different um, checks and balances that are there, the copy editing, the editing, the vetting, the, the, you know, from the headline to the photo, all the care and attention that is given to a story that the reader or the viewer only sees at the very end. Um, I get encouraged, for example, when um, you see these Kickstarter campaigns for new restaurants, for pop-up restaurants. But I think people are more informed and are likely to give because everybody probably has made a meal and thinks about oh my, the overhead and what it takes to source those ingredients. And I think if we w found a way to talk more about journalism and all the work that it takes, why does a video story take what, the cost, the camera, the gear, all of that, and really inform the public? I think the public would be hungry and would be responsive. That may sound a little naive and hopeful, but, uh, but I like to, to, to have those qualities and embrace that. Because I think um, it's exciting that, um, you know, even five years ago, uh, I don't think, how old is Evergrey? Okay, so just in, just in a matter of, the, you know, certainly we've seen um, the, um, the sunsetting of media outlets here in Seattle, but we also see arrivals and we see growth in existing organizations and we see innovation and energy and championing um, of new products. So I think, um, you know, if anybody can figure out a way to launch a successful media entity, it would be in the North Pacific Northwest because that's kind of what we're all about. All right, and Mac, I realize this is why I agree with what you just said. Um, I wanted to address a part of your question that I didn't, which is the bubble piece of it and the algorithms and the platform. And this is um, something that I think the Seattle Times is handling fairly well. I think what it boils down to in part is metrics and your relationship with them. I have worked for newsrooms that, you know, fetishize chart feed. And if all you're looking at is the number of people who are clicking on a story, and if that's all, if that's the tone your organization sets, if you're looking at Omniture for that 30-day book, you're going to be not, you're going to be asking the wrong questions about your coverage, sort of like the way Joe was saying she can find any patterns. It's because it, the data is incomplete. So what if we all work for newsrooms that are able to set metrics around values like reporting and impact and what we look at at the Seattle Times, which is, see for some of this is subscriptions, but at EdLab in particular, we're always logging our impact, whether it's a reader email or a law that was changed. And, and I feel strongly about that because it, it takes us off the bubble, it takes us away from the algorithms, but when it comes to the team of reporters that I manage, it orients them around how they pick their next stories. You know, what sort of uh, sign of success is in their heads as they pick how to move on to the next thing, and if it's how they made things better, then they're gonna pick the right next story. So new, maybe in the interest of time, if we could get a final batch of questions, um, so maybe three questions that can get asked consecutively, and then we'll have people respond to different aspects of it. Um, just in the interest of time. So I, I, I've seen a, a bunch of people in the back with their hands up for a while. Hi, I'm <coughs> Hannah. Um, I'm a student and hopefully eventually a journalist. 
I was wondering how you keep your opinions and your stories separate, just how you protect your stories from your own bias. Hi, my name is Jenny Gritters. I'm a freelance journalist. Um, and I was wondering what topic is the most challenging to cover in Seattle and why you think it's so challenging, whether it's homelessness, climate change, whatever. Um, I'd love to hear about kind of how you tackle it and why it's hard. Hi, my name is James Gaines. I'm also a freelance journalist. And I was curious, uh, in my journalism career, I've heard the advice, be ready to move wherever the job is. And I'm wondering how that thinking about a future pool of journalists, uh, how we can keep Seattle's, Seattleites who are journalists and who want to be journalists in the city so we can build up that uh, institutional knowledge or if that's something we should even be thinking about. Well, I can start with the last one and a journalist who was indeed taught to move where the job is and who did move where the job was. So I moved from New York to Los Angeles without having ever been there, without going home to drive, which was a trial to Seattle, where I'd been once. And I think you asked a very valid question. Part of what it comes down to is money. Seattle is a smaller city, and its institutions are working. Our biggest problem is how do we monetize this work that we all agree is valuable, and for Seattle's news outlets to all be competitive with other places where people might want to go. They have to be able to pay salaries that keep a pace with the growing cost of living here and that are competitive with what people in other cities would offer. Um, I also, I moved to Washington, D.C. without ever having been to Washington, D.C. for a job. So I think sometimes it's, Sometimes it's worth it. Um, and I think that you th when people tell you to go, like, go where the jobs are, sometimes uh, they make, you make an assumption that it's a small town, but sometimes it's places like D.C. or New York where there's just a lot of, there are a lot of media jobs. So there's more turnover, um, possibly more opportunity. I was told that if you could get a job covering the Hill and got some expertise covering, cap covering Congress, that you could basically, like, get a job anywhere after that. Um, and that was that really was very useful. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to tackle though the most challenging topic to cover, and I would say it's homelessness for sure, um, because obviously the city is very divided over it and divided about how we talk about it. Um, I also think you can there are different approaches to the coverage where you can go into you can go into the go, you could go into your next door app and just figure out, see the conversation happening there. That's super charged and um, not necessarily based in fact, and you could cover it that way, or you can cover it in a, there's a report out from King County Council that says X, and then no one will read that story. <laughs> so it's kind of about finding ways to tap in, like to reflect accurately the frustration people feel here about homelessness without, um, without than being, uh, and without completely dismissing, I think that there's a lot of data that our journalists are aware of that they could use to refute, to say that those people are, or what they're seeing is not really truly happening. Um, and we fall into that sometimes, but I think there are ways to, to talk to the small business owners who are frustrated and who are seeing a real impact on their business and get letting them be a part of the conversation on our air a little bit more. And you have, but then also having to find ways that like these reports are important um, the data is incredibly important, but at the same time, you have to get at it from a human, like a human, you need to get in the door from like a human perspective or a, char a, a strong character or something that is going to grab people beyond, uh, I mean, I, I listened to one report before an edit and it was like in one four minute piece, there was the, ter the word proposal six times. It's deadly for radio. So it's, you just have to figure out um, ways to include the facts, which because they're incredibly important without letting it become a complete process city story. I'll make a really quick plug. So I'm the co-organizer for the Online News Association in Seattle and trying to bring it a little bit back to life here since it's been come dormant for a while. And we're doing these monthly events. And the next one um, that I'm trying to organize is a conversation around Como's Seattle is Dying documentary. Um, I think this is speaking exactly to what Jill is talking about. It is a 
super challenging issue to cover right now um, because the city is so split on it. Um, and I think it's worthwhile for journalists to come together and talk about what we can learn from that documentary and the conversation it generated. Um, so if you are interested in learning more, you are welcome to email me or talk to me after this event. Um, but we would love to get more folks uh, participating in that conversation. I'll talk a little bit about bias. Um, the first question, um, how do you um, how do you try to prevent your biases from influencing your journalism? And I think um, it really uh, it's really about knowing your biases to begin with and having deep conversations with your editor. Um, I think that's probably one of the things that's the most challenging when I've worked with citizen journalists or journalists who, or people who have never written journalism. That is uh, a hard thing to, to, try to, to try to teach, to try to educate, to try to inform why your opinion really it doesn't matter in this particular piece. Um, I think it's, it, it's important that um, when you write a story, you are writing for the person who is most interested in that subject, but the story should be as good and as interesting to the person who could care less about the subject. I think it's important that you move uh, the wheel, so to speak, and look at complete, uh, constantly look at different entry points when you're covering a story. Um, I think uh, it's important that you have people who are different in a newsroom. I've had lots of conversations where I know that I may be too close to a subject, and so I will throw it to somebody else who may have more of a critical eye to make sure that I'm on point and not leaning one way or the other. Um, we are not advocates. Um, if we are advocating anything, is that we are presenting you with intelligent information so that you can make your own decisions. Um, and so I think that conversation, it, it's a hard one. It, it certainly has become increasingly harder with social media and with things that may hit really close to home uh, to your own being or to your family situation, to your own politics. Um, but we try very hard to, to listen, to keep our own, um, to keep our mouths shut when it comes to um, you know, showing how we may believe in you know, our beliefs. Um, and really, um, you know, if things are sensitive, definitely bring it up to an editor. Definitely have lots of people look at it. Um, that is, that's the worst thing you can do is, is to, inf you know, present a piece that is too one-sided. It's, if that's what you really want to do, you should, you should not be a journalist. If I could just jump on that really quick in terms of the bias there. Um, we got some feedback at KOW about our coverage of the measles um, crisis, emergency here in Washington state, and people who are like, I've trusted KOW to be balanced and unbiased, and yet you're not giving equal time to the people who feel vaccines can cause autism or hurt their child. And um, that's when things get really tricky. <laughs> um, and, you know, we had, we've, but we've had, we had a big conversation in our newsroom about it. We, um, NPR's public editor actually came to town right at that same time and we had a big conversation with her about what, about the ethics of this. And it's about, you know, you have to have compassion for people who, who believe that, but, in, but the reality is you also don't want to be putting false information out there as equivalent to accurate information. So I know that there are other questions. However, we've, we're out of time that we have for the room, so we're gonna have to end it here um, in terms of, of the formal part of the event. However, if you do have a question and um, you do wanna stick around, um, it sounds like at least Annika said that she was going to be around. I don't wanna speak for the others, um, but um, I just wanna sort of close by saying thank you to everyone for coming, and most especially thank you to our four great panelists for their thoughts tonight. Thank you, guys.